Pep. I'm the president of Active Watch for Waiting Australasia and the founder of Australian Parents of ROGD Kids. I'm also a member of Partners for Ethical Care based in the US. What I'm here to talk to you about today has utterly consumed the past eight years of my life, but I've only got a few minutes to talk about just the main parts with you today. In 2016, when my daughter was 15, I was quite thrown quite suddenly into the world of the transgender movement after she had been raped by a schoolmate. She'd written in an exercise book, left out in the open, it's been seven days since they raped me. I was horrified, especially thinking that more than one person had raped her. When I asked her about it, she explained that it was only one person whose preferred pronouns was they. That was my first encounter with preferred pronouns. I contacted the police the next day, but they weren't interested in investigating. We took our daughter to a psychologist and I pulled her out of school to start her at TAFE to get her away from the rapist. My daughter made a series of claims over the next following over the following several weeks. First, that she was confused when a male friend who'd also been raped by the same individual had adopted what I've come to now, now know as an opposite sex gender identity. Next, that she was a lesbian. And finally, that she believed herself to be um, a male trapped in a female body, which she passionately defended as fact, despite all biological realities. I took her to our GP who referred her to our gender clinic and we were told not to expect an appointment for a few months. During my wait, my, during our wait, um, my daughter had a stranger from an organisation called Transfolk posing as a Department of Child Protection officer come and actually push through our home to remove her after I had rightly taken away her, her phone for late night misconduct. The, the police ended up being called by this stranger, at which point my daughter claimed that she was suicidal using scripted words and phrasing. The police took her for a psych psychiatric evaluation. While waiting in the hospital, my daughter mentioned to the police who stayed with her that she'd been raped, finally prompting an investigation to which I contributed the exercise book. The psychiatrist that she saw firstly told us that she was not in fact suicidal, but to respect her wishes because it's better to have a live son than a dead daughter. The first, but not the last time that I've heard this all too common threat. They sent my daughter home and gave, gave us a list of rules to follow. Nothing to do with being suicidal or for the rape trauma, but only for her new gender identity. No taking away devices, no punishments for anything. And we were had to remove all childhood photos from our walls at that as that person was said now to be dead. A woman that was sent, then sent to our home from where I'm not actually sure um, and actually interrogated us for hours and actually confirmed to our daughter that we were terrible abusive parents. Her only evidence of this that we hadn't taken her childhood photos down off our walls. Our first appointment at the gender clinic, the nurse gave my daughter a form, which I later learned was a consent form. She explained the gender, the gender clinic process really quickly and skimmed over the very basic medical risks and then suggested that she starts on puberty blockers all within 25 minutes. When I declined them, the nurse said, well, maybe just some testosterone. I declined that again. So the nurse advised my daughter to wait and go to the adult gender clinic when she turned 18. At later appointments, the head of psychiatry at the clinic insisted that my daughter's rape trauma had nothing to do with her new gender identity. My daughter was receiving no help for her trauma. As my work history includes working in medical settings, both with Western medicine and with natural therapies, what stunned me the most at this appointment was that from the moment my daughter said she was transgender, it was completely accepted as truth by the treating professionals. There was no medical investigation. There was no explanation of what, there was no exploring of what had caused her very sudden and complete change in personality. I wondered, and I still wonder, how vulnerable youth are able to access medication and surgery, both which have lifelong side effects without any exploration whatsoever. In what other illness or condition does a doctor or therapist blindly accept a person's say-so as truth? Would a doctor start treating a cancer patient with chemotherapy drugs without thorough exploration? Would a doctor allow a patient with anorexia to have gastric banding or take weight loss medications? A few months later, um, angry that I hadn't agreed to the hormones, my daughter ran away. We called the police who located her but refused to tell us where she was. They told her that she they told us that she'd moved in with someone from the trans community. She later moved into a halfway house for homeless youth, despite having been very welcomed still to move back home. After that shock wore off slightly, we followed up with the police regarding our daughter's rape. They had destroyed the notebook, their only evidence.
the police, the police department, the police corruptions department, the police ombudsman and the freedoms of information all refused to answer our questions about it. We'd hit a brick wall. Time passed and we met with our daughter just after her 18th birthday. She started taking testosterone injections just a few weeks later. The first time she called me after that, I almost didn't believe it was her on the phone. Her voice had changed so much. I thought somebody had, had taken her phone and was just making like a prank call. Over the next few years, she only called when she needed something, but I always came running. I used her new name, but that wasn't enough for her. She demanded that I state I'd, that I'd given birth to two sons and no daughter at all. I wasn't willing to change my history to help her to rewrite her own. A GoFundMe page my daughter had set up to pay for the removal of her breasts listed her surgeon's name, so I decided to contact him to explain that she was struggling with untreated rape trauma and in extreme emotional distress. We'd learnt that she'd been in and out of high security mental health facilities throughout the, the previous year. Although he seemed compassionate at the time, he actually ended up giving our daughter all of our email communication. She had the surgery to remove her breasts in January 21 during the COVID outbreak when all non-essential sur surgeries were cancelled. Although she got what she wanted, she was furious with me for interfering and so she cut ties completely. Since this began, I've spent all of my time reading and researching. I found, a, I found a group called Parents of ROGD Kids who asked me to start a parent support group in Australia, which I did. Which I did. Our numbers have grown very quickly. I personally still now speak to each new member so they don't feel as desperate, as desperate and isolated as crazy and as crazy as I did eight years ago. I've heard hundreds of parent stories and their similarities are astonishing. Their children are using the same words and phrases, the script as the parents call it. We're following the same, this, they are following the same steps to transition. The parents are of different races, beliefs and backgrounds from all over Australia, UK, US, Canada, Israel, Italy, Hong Kong, Sweden, Singapore and New Zealand. How are children all over the world saying and doing exactly the same thing? Why are their parents being told exactly the same thing? Better a live son than a dead daughter or vice versa. This statement is not only emotional blackmail, it's also not true. We didn't get another live son. We got a medically mutilated, distressed, pseudo pretend, pretend son. But to us, she's still our very much loved daughter. I've spoken to many detransitioners whose story of regret also follow a marked pattern. Most left with with anger towards the parents and individuals who affirmed their delusions. These young people are not even giving the care they desperately need now that they're no longer transgender, they're no longer in. Skeptics are often quick to comment over um, to parents who share their stories of their young adult children that their children was, were over 18, a legal adult, when they made their decision. This infuriates parents. When do you stop being a parent? If your adult child had cancer or was a drug addict, would the concern for their welfare suddenly stop because the child is a young adult? Absolutely not. Self-ID and changing birth certificate to match someone's perception of themselves is unrealistic and it's dangerous. Regardless of how many cosmetic procedures or how much medication a person take, takes, their natal sex does not ever change. Many of the youth and young people seeking these change are quite well unwell mentally, my daughter included. She believes she's part alien. Other youth believe that themselves to be part animals, raccoons or coyotes, for example. A Queensland school recently reported a student identifying as a cat. Will these other non-human forms of self-identification be legislated also? I've spoken to parents whose children are socially transitioned in schools without parents' knowledge or consent. Parents are losing custody of their children after expressing their concern about their children transitioning. Department of Child Protection are claiming these non-affirming parents to be abusive, putting not only the child wanting to transition at risk, but also the other siblings who are not involved. Parents are rightly concerned about the permanent and significant harms of gender affirming drugs and the surgery. This is not abuse. The newest group of children wanting to transition don't even appear to have gender dysphoria. Girls in their early teens coming out as transgender at school but are perfectly happy to be female after school and on weekends. Girls who still prefer dresses and makeup are dressing as males during school hours. These girls have a history of being lonely or being bullied. They're often on the autism spectrum. When they transition, they're love bombed and suddenly they're in the popular crowd where they receive lots of the attention they desperately claim. We believe these children have gender ideation trans trenders as they're now called on social media. 
what happens to these children? They're pipelined into medically and surgically transitioned. When someone is pretending to be someone they're not, keeping up the pretense gets harder. Can you imagine how ostracized and bullied they would be from walking away from their transgender persona? These teens and young adults have more risk of suicide after they transition. Bernard Lane, a, a reporter formerly of The Australian, just 12 hours ago released an article stating that the Dutch clinic, which pioneered the use of affirming care with puberty blockers on youth, have admitted that 93% of youth starting puberty blockers go on to transition with wrong sex hormones. Michelle Telfer from the Royal Children's Hospital in 2014 spoke about how children with gender incongruence during early puberty, around 89% would desist, that is not to transition, by the end of puberty if left alone. This statistic is widely recognised, so why are we allowing children to socially transition? The Daily Mail Australia on the 22nd of October 2022 wrote that doctors in the UK will no longer encourage gender curious children to use preferred pronouns or dress in the opposite sex in their new NHS guidelines. Switzerland also has recently banned the use of preferred pronouns. With other countries waking up to the dangers of gender ideology, why is Australia still ignoring the recent studies and putting more coal into the fire of gender ideology? Surely our children are not so different from the children in the UK or in certain states in the US or in Sweden or in Finland, just to name a few. Court cases are coming. Even in Australia, there is a current medical negligence case for a detransitioner who has been irreparably harmed. Parents of children who've been harmed by this ideology will continue to fight against this ideology, which goes against just the most basic biology and reality. No one, no person is born in the wrong body. Maybe it started it's time that we started actually focusing on helping people to be comfortable in the skin they're in rather than pipelining them into chemical castration and a lifetime dependency on big pharma. Thanks for listening to me.